Welcome to a Seeing Them Live After Show Report. Today we'll delve into the music, atmosphere, fan reactions, and any unusual circumstances from a specific live music event. Everyone has a concert story. Maybe one day we'll hear yours. We're both sitting there. I'm like mesmerized. I can't take my eyes off of it. Like I'm watching the whole thing. You know what I mean? You know, soup to nuts, the good, the bad, the ugly. Like I'm just there for it. Our guests today are Eric Green and Scott Patrick Wiener. Eric is an award-winning writer, director, and producer of documentary films, features, and shorts. And he's also a blogger. Scott is an artist, lifelong skateboarder, and currently teaches art at Hanscom Middle School in Massachusetts. Eric and Scott have both recently appeared on Seeing Them Live in separate episodes over the past few weeks. So why are they back on the podcast so soon? Well, Eric and Scott were both at the now infamous Jane's Addiction show in Boston, where vocalist Perry Farrell attacked guitarist Dave Navarro. We're calling this a special Seeing Them Live After Show Report. Eric and Scott, welcome back to Seeing Them Live. Thanks for having us, Charles. This is great. Yeah, this is awesome. Thanks again. When Scott shot me an email about this happening, I I hadn't even read anything about it or saw anything about it. So I was like, what? You know, but then I, I kind of got my bearings like, oh, okay, I... Yeah, I could see that happening, but I thought before we get started, guys, maybe Eric, you've got in your on your blog, you've got an article about this concert and it's at greensparty.tumblr.com. And what I thought was interesting about that blog, not only the the description of what happened at the concert, but your relationship with Scott and how you guys kind of bonded over Jane's addiction, and you called it like this full circle moment. So you want to just talk about how this all came about, you guys going to this show? Yeah, so um, Scott and I are longtime friends uh, and everything going back to uh, high school. So um, prior to the summer before high school, I went to Lollapalooza 91 uh, that I discussed on the, uh, the last show that I was on. And, uh, you know, as, as we all know, Jane's Addiction were the headliners and Perry Farrell was the creator of it. And they decided to end on top at the end of that tour. And so anyways, uh, yeah, Scott and I, we met in uh, high school English class. He had just moved uh, to Bedford, Massachusetts. And uh, yeah, we, we were just in English class. We're, we're just talking. We had this assignment where we had to go around and talk about famous people with the same name as us. I, I guess there was some some assignment. And I, uh, I mentioned, uh, you know, a few uh, people, public figures with that name, including Eric Avery. And the one person that responded to that was Scott. And so from then on, he and I became friends. We bonded over Jane's Addiction, Red Hot Chili Peppers, and multiple other bands. And we've uh, remained really good friends ever since. And since high school, we worked at a video store together. He's helped me out with a lot of film projects that I've done. And I've helped him out. He did this great skateboard documentary uh, that he put on YouTube last year that I helped out with as well. And uh, yeah, we've remained really good friends. And uh, so uh, with my blog, I sometimes get to do uh, concert reviews. And uh, for this one, I I don't, sometimes I'll just go with my own iPhone and kind of take pictures there. But for this, I put in a photo request and, you know, Scott's not just some guy I know with a camera. He's actually a photographer, like a very skilled photographer who's had, you know, shows and whatnot. And uh, this is really meeting of, you know, Scott's interests and professional, you know, photographic abilities coming together. So yeah, it was exciting that the two of us, after all these years, got to go to Jane's Addiction together with this particular lineup, first lineup since, what, 2010, uh, this this particular classic lineup. And uh, yeah, so he and I got to go together. You got the photo pass, you got to go into the photo pit. And then uh, we were there, almost like a mystery science theater commentary throughout the whole show and stuff. So yeah, there was this kind of backstory of the two of us just forming that friendship out of similar bands that we both liked and then uh, remaining friends. And to this day, we still go to record stores together. We still go to concerts and things like that. And uh, then getting to go see this particular band with this particular lineup that particular night. So go ahead, Scott. That's right. That was uh, Miss O'Malley's freshman English at Bedford High in 1991. There they were, an insecure and flailing young Scott Wiener running around with Doc Martens and floppy hair. 
um, and a skateboard. And then there was Eric, mature beyond his years, <laughs> talking about Eric Avery. And I turn, I remember like turning around and being like, I remember it. I'm sitting at the desk and I just whip around and I'm like, Jane's addiction. <laughs> right. Because it was like, I was like, oh my God, somebody else likes music that isn't like, I mean, what were people listening to then? Like Bell Biv DeVoe or whatever that, whatever that was. <laughs> like, um, but uh, yeah, I had a, uh, my, uh, my dad was a military guy. Uh, we had um, right outside of Bedford, there's this uh, base called Hanscom. We had moved there in 19 or we had moved on to the base in 91. And like, I was, you know, popping into Bedford high. But uh, yeah, it was awesome. Eric actually in also interviewed, he did a documentary at the end of high school. What was it like, where are you gonna, what, like, what do you think you're gonna be doing? It was the, I made a video time capsule just talking oh. to the people in our class and I put it together, it aired at the, you know, all night graduation party and then we, it's been pulled out for all the reunions and things of that nature. And yeah, Scott was amongst the interviewees for it and stuff. But uh, yeah, it was like, it was like this whole like Jane's addiction thing was pretty interesting because like I, I was going back and forth. I wanted to go to it, but all the footage that I had been seeing online made it look, it's like Harry looked like he was going to die on stage. Like he was real, like hobbly going up to the microphone, almost like he was holding onto the microphone for support. And I was like, I don't know. I've been singing summertime roles to my kids since she was, since she was a baby. And I was like, oh, maybe Jane's could be her first show. And then I saw footage for this stuff and I was like, nope, no, no, no. I'm not taking her to see this like guy keel over and die like because he can't handle his alcohol. I texted you like a couple weeks beforehand and I was like, dude, I'm still on the fence. The Jane's tickets are going down in price. It's not sold out. And Eric's like, dude, I'm, I'm, I put in for a press pass. I'm going to put in for a photo pass for you. And you know, we didn't know it was going to happen, but then like Eric texts me the day before he's like, dude, like I'm like in the middle of like in between classes. Cause you know, I, I'm teaching art at this middle school and um, Eric's like, dude, dude, we got him. Check your email. So we were, I, and all of a sudden, like both of us who were like a little bit ambivalent about going, were all of a sudden super hyped, right? Oh. We went, I, like the first three songs happened and I was like, I was like kind of hopeful. Remember Eric? I was like, oh, this might actually be good. The first three songs you rocked. They played yeah. Kettle Whistle with the original lineup, probably for the first time since like 87 or something. My date might be a little off, but it's around that time. And that like blew me away. That was a big moment for me. Like, and also getting to be right up front. And then at, as I was leaving, Perry Farrell reached out his fist and bumped me. And I told Eric I would never wash this hand again. And then I immediately went to the bathroom and washed my hand. <laughs> <laughs> now, where do you get when you guys have these passes? And so you're like in the photo pit or you're both in there then? Um, no, he, a, photographer only uh, for the okay. photo pit. I, I was off to the side, um, yeah. but uh, wait until he got out and stuff. But, uh, oh, we should also add Love and Rockets uh, were the support sure. act on this. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm by no means an expert on them, but, you know, I like their music and we got, can't, got there just in time to hear a lot of the big hits. And, you know, I know, uh, Charles, maybe you can correct me on this. I think this was like their first tour in, what, five years or something like that in the U.S.? But um, it was definitely cool to see them and, you know, Dave Navarro has spoken so fondly about, you know, how he was influenced by them and to have them on the tour was a big deal for him. So it was definitely cool to see, you know, that that era of, you know, 80s college rock, you know, there on the stage and that they kind of didn't miss a beat either. Just uh, just from what we saw of them as we were getting ready. So then you're on the stage then uh, after the three photographs or you're like off to the side. It's sort of the front, yeah, the front. This is the Leader Bank Pavilion. It's sort of this outdoor waterfront uh, music venue in Boston. So, no, it's not. It's Harbor Lights. It's always Harbor Lights. <laughs> it's one of these venues that's changed its name. New New Bank buys it every other year or something like that. But, hey, you know, yeah, Boston is called Harbor Lights, what it was in the 90s. But, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's waterfront, it's outdoors. And this is sort of kind of the tail end of the season um, for, for them and stuff. So, uh, yeah, so this was, uh, you know, kind of, you know, their seat. And then towards the back, I think there was like kind of an open area. But uh, but yeah, so Scott uh, was in that very front area between between the barricades and the audience and then the stage. That's where the photo pit was for this show. Yeah. And um, like my my experience in photography is is uh, very particular to fine artwork. Um, that's what my degrees are in. Um, so I'd actually never gotten a press pass to photograph a band before. Like I photographed bands, like, but you know, like high school or like college just for like friends bands or something like that. So that it was a bit of a new experience for me. 
Um, but it was also like a really profound one because it was Jane's addiction. Like I don't, I, I probably talked about this on the show, but like Jane's addiction is one of the most significant parts of my life soundtrack. Like I, every time I listen to them, I connect to the music. It's super emotional for me. Like I have all kinds of weird high school memories, good and bad that are associated with it, like with the music. So being up front for what, you know, even before I knew it, I was like, you know, this could be the last time we tour. You know what I mean? It's like, you, who knows if they're what they're going to do after. It was really meant a lot to me. And it's like um, I was I, I was psyched to do it in the beginning. But like my gratitude became more pronounced for Eric for find for actually getting like getting the pass and making it happen, like became more pronounced afterwards because it was like I mean, it was a really emotional thing for me to be up front there and photographing this band that I have loved. And then, you know, so first three songs, they're like, OK, you everyone goes. And then I went out, found Eric and we stood on the side and just watched the show for the rest of the rest of the time they played. Prior to this altercation, how was the show? I mean, what did you think of it? It was by no means, like Scott was just saying, this was by no means the worst concert we had ever been to or I had ever been to. But I think hopes were really high that it was the this classic lineup. The hopes were high because they've gone through various iterations. The fact that Dave Navarro uh, had, had just come back from like a bout of long COVID, so he wasn't even on the last few tours. The fact that Eric Avery was back. The fact that the band was, you know, finally together and they were actually touring. I think there was hope that, you know, yeah, you know, this band still has it. And, you know, they've done so many classic songs and two, two of my all time favorite albums uh, there. And, you know, I mean, they've they've done it different iterations. They've done different lineups, different albums even. But I, I think there was just high hopes. And it was the mu musically, I thought it was really good. I think some of the just vocals were kind of off coming in at strange times and the lyrics were a little off so there was definitely something kind of strange in the air about this uh, particular show up until that point but uh, i think you know there's definitely no denying the musicianship which was exciting to hear certain songs getting played there and stuff yeah i'll add the band was on fire like they were so good like the version of three days that they did, there was a breakdown in the middle that they had never that I'd never heard them play before. It sounded like it was new um, to this version where it was just Steven and Eric just driving the drum and the bass like and it was this amazing, amazing instrumentation. I mean, Navarro was top form that like the band themselves, Eric, Dave, Steven were like top, top, top form like so 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 good eric eric avery has always been my favorite member of this band um because so much of their music is wrapped around his melodic bass lines yeah. um but like i think i was mentioning this before if i did mention before i'll mention it again like this band has always been volatile like they the majority of their classic output was written before the first record came out like all like nothing shocking, all that stuff already existed as well as all of the material for Ritual De Lo Habitual with the exception of the song, I think it's called Of Course, the one that with the sitar in it, Eric, oh, yeah. um, that I, I was telling yeah. you, like, it's the one, it's the one song that Eric Avery didn't play on on that album. I think that was a new track, but you know, it's like, at, like the band was on and I'll, I'll just add like uh, my experience of Perry, like he was great for the first three songs. He was good for the next three. Like the version of Summertime Rolls was pretty good. And then like whatever the three songs were leading up to Mountain Song, like like Eric was saying, he's forgetting the lyrics. He's coming in off cue. He's slurring his speech. I don't know, like kind of stumbling a little bit. And I was like, okay, like this. And then that's when I was like, okay, this is what I've been seeing online. Like, this is the footage that I, a lot of the footage that I've been seeing. This rings true. They're going to, in my, I was just like, oh, they're just going to push through. And then they're playing Mountain Song. And Perry's kind of all over the place. And then all of a sudden, he leaves stage. And he comes, and he, he like goes off stage. And then he comes back moments later. And he's all like full of energy and angry. And he's yelling, fuck him as a part of the lyrics to Eric and he's yelling, fuck him 
to Dave Navarro, and then you know the rest uh, you're aware of. You know, gets in a, gets in Dave Navarro's face and starts the whole thing. I saw that on some videos, and three days prior prior to that song, Mountain Song, and this is from a set list. Uh, I'm assuming it's at. Excuse me, Ocean Size is the song that they like fell apart on, where like the fight happened. But I think the trouble started brewing, you know, that video and there, you guys have probably seen them online. There's this video where Navarro walks over to Perry and kind of gets his attention. And then with his index finger, like gives him the follow me symbol, you know, or gesture. And then he goes and takes his guitar solo, which I guess isn't something that unusual in that song he would he, I guess he's signaled before when he's going to take the guitar solo. But then the, that camera, whoever's shooting this video, pans back to Perry. And, man, he is, like, shooting daggers at Navarro. Like, he looks pissed. Well, alcohol's a hell of a drug. Scott, when you say then, you know, then they played three days, I guess. You know, maybe this was really over that 90-minute song. Yeah, there was stuff going on. Like, I, there were a couple times where Eric and where Dave walked over to Eric and they had some sidebars. There was also a moment where Eric and Dave and Steven were kind of in the same place, like maybe talking yeah. to each other or something. Like there were these things where like they were having some kind of huddles about something or other. And I have a feeling now that it was about Perry. I mean, obvi obviously, you know, like Scott was saying, it's a volatile, you know, we're, we're talking about a band where there's really a darkness to their music. You know, I mean, this isn't just some, you know, band that does songs about girls in cars or, or Van Halen or, or whatever, you know, like this is a band that, where there's a lot of darkness just in the subject matter. And, you know, you something that, you know, Scott and I talk about, not, not even with this band, but just about creativity in general is, you know, I think when you're collaborating in, well, specific to music here, but anytime you get a lot of different people with different personality types and different you know perspectives and ideas you know that that can be really interesting to have those differences coming together in a collaboration but at the same time it can also make it really difficult for those pe same different people to be in a band together and i think you know it's it, especially all these larger than life personalities in one band you know it can you know there's obviously some bands i, I think a lot of a lot of fans like to think that Bands are like the monkeys, like they all live together, hang out together and, you know, and get into misadventures together and then they play a show together. But the reality is some bands, like they really only talk when they're on stage, just it's like a business or whatever. And it can be it can be a hard thing to, you know, I, I saw Flea in an interview saying it can be a really hard thing to just be in a band and put your ego aside and think about the greater good and think about the fans. It's a hard thing. So I mean, certainly no judgment in terms of the, the backstory, the history or anything like that. But, you know, you hope for the best. You hope as a fan that the band's going to be able to really follow through and, and do the best show possible and make the best music possible. Yeah. And as like, I mean, Eric and I, have. I mean, I, I wrote this in my post. It's like we have been loving this band since we were kids and I don't, I, I don't know if everyone experiences, but I think people who love music really experience this, like who like dial into it and have these like em emotional connections to certain to certain songs. You know who put this best is Cameron Crowe speaking through Penny Lane. Um, I'm not going to in Almost Famous. It's like when oh, actually it was through for um, the Faruza Balk character was talking about like a lot of people don't understand, like when you love a band so much, you're willing to do anything just to be close to it. Like just to be close to that music i'm paraphrasing but it's something along those lines jane's addiction was like that for me i know it was like uh i know that or not was they are like that for me they are like that for eric green not avery but uh to get to see for them to even get back together and like play as the the original lineup again was like a huge deal like i was so excited when i heard it and then i started seeing some of the footage and then i was like maybe i'm not that excited but they released two new songs and that's a good thing. You had pointed that out and because I was on the fence, I think I told you that, you know, they were playing on a Tuesday night here in Chicago at the Aragon Ballroom. And I was like, eh, that's rough, you know, a, a school night, so to speak. Hey, you never know. Like they could have gotten in a fight in Chicago. I mean, this could have happened anywhere. 
I'll tell you my Chicago story in, in a bit, which was b- a bizarre occurrence with Perry again. So when did you guys realize what was going on? Yeah, I looked away uh, for like a nanosecond. Yeah, I'm jumping in for this one because I'm like, we're both sitting there. I'm like mesmerized. Like, I'm just like, I can't take my eyes off of it. Like, I'm watching the whole thing. You know what I mean? You know, soup to nuts, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Like, I'm just there for it. You know what I mean? I just photographed them from, I was closer than the people in the front row. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm on like cloud nine. And again, Eric. I will love you forever for this. This is like we got. We have to do this again. Is what we have to do, Scott. We have to do another concert review. We gotta like go the next show we go to together. That band obviously has to get in a fight. <laughs> it's, it's us. The problem is us. <laughs> I know. We we showed up and ruined everything. But I'm like you know I'm like dialed in. I'm super absorbed, right? And then all of a sudden, like you know, Perry's like doing this thing, and he's like yelling at them. Then he goes over to Dave and shoulder shoulder text. I look over to Eric, and Eric was like, he had just like looked down at his phone for a second. And I'm like, dude, 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 they're fighting! Look, look, like they're like and they're they're like Perry is attacking Dave. And then it got worse and worse. And then oh, everything that you know, like they, you know, the three guys, like uh, Eric went over to the drum set. Dave and Steven came out from behind. They all like took a bow, said thank you, left the stage. It was interesting because Steven sort of like wandered a little bit before he went in. Like mm-hmm. he was, I think he was like alone for a second and then he took off. And then we were like, uh, that's got to be it. And then the house lights came up and they started playing whatever exit music they had. I, I mean, it was like, yeah, the lights going on kind of was uh, that. And I, I guess, you know, there was a good three or four more songs they had been doing on this tour. So, uh, we did not get Classic Girl, which is my personal all-time favorite song of theirs. And we didn't get a stop. We didn't get Being Caught Stealing. So, you know, it was really a, a bummer that it kind of ended on that. And already just, you know, already then social media is blowing up about this. My phone, everyone's like, oh, are you, did you guys see this? What happened? Uh, and, and everybody's going crazy. And then by the time I get home, all of a sudden there's like, then news outlets are picking up on this story. Like, and not just like local, like CNN is talking about this. Variety, Hollywood Reporter, everyone's like, you know, just like, hey, at a Jane's Addiction show in Boston, violence breaks out from the band and all the all is all the headlines and stuff. And then I haven't even written the review. I haven't figured processed everything about what I just watched yet. And now all of all of this is going down. So Scott was just getting his photos in order on the car ride uh, home and stuff. So, you know, it's kind of you don't always get that experience where all of a sudden there was just this, you know, atomic bomb in the middle of a concert review what you're you're setting out to do and stuff i have to say it was amazing it was probably one of the most significant concert going experiences of my entire life from like the highest high to the weirdest weird all i could think of all i could think of like the best headline would have been harry farrell he's exactly like you thought he would be (laughs) because it's like i mean let's be honest like if you know anything about Jane's Addiction or if you follow them at all, like Perry Farrell is a fucking asshole. Like he's <laughs> not awesome, but he's a great singer and he's a great front man. And when those four guys get together and make music, it is like earth shattering. I don't know what you guys saw, but like, you know, from the video I was watching, Eric Avery's, I think it was Eddie Farrell saying that he punched Perry a few times. But I noticed, and I don't know who who this was, but when Perry's kind of bound up with all these people trying to restrain him, he's hitting somebody in the neck, in the back of the head with the microphone. Yes. Is that the roadie? I'm sure uh, that probably doesn't feel too good. And and maybe, I don't know if that was Eric Avery or who that, or who he was doing that to, but, you know, maybe just trying to bend himself, you know? Honestly, like Eddie Farrell's too close to this. I don't, take her account into consideration. I basically give it very, very little, very little credibility because of the because of the enabling that was evident in that post. This is what I'll say from all the videos that I've seen and from watching it. Perry Farrell was not calm when they were restraining him. He was flailing about. He was swinging like if like if in fact Eric Avery did hit him, which is really hard to see from those angles. Like you can see arms moving and then there's one part where it's unclear whether or not it's his arm or Perry's or the roadie. Like it's hard to tell. But one thing is for certain, Perry Farrell chose violence and he continued to choose violence even as he was being restrained. Like, I don't think they're like 
I don't think there's any cheap shots going on in there. I think that they were trying to contain him because he left the stage drunk and came back really, really awake. Absolutely. I think, you know, it's it, kind of a very fine line between was was it a cheap shot or was it simply trying to restrain someone who was out of control? Everyone's been dissecting these fan videos like it's the Zapruder film, basically. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like, whoa, at this angle, it's this. So I don't know, uh, Scott, somebody might teach a class just about this show uh, someday or something. Oh, my God. I'm going to teach it. Something you brought up, Charles, about Eddie Farrell's um, post, you mentioned tinnitus uh, was being an issue. And it's not uncommon in this day and age to see musicians on stage with like earpieces where they're getting a direct feed of the instruments to be able to hear on stage, to be able to be in sync. So I think, you know, obviously there's treatments, you know, that, that are there if that's the case. And uh you know, I was reminded of something. I, I did a short documentary about uh, the Beatles' uh, history with Boston, and um, not to compare the Beatles and Jane's Addiction at all, but because Jane's Addiction is clearly better. All right. Well, let's. Uh, <laughs> you want me to take the bait, Scott? But like one of the interviewees we had in there, uh, he brought up a point saying, you know, this is 1964 Beatles, but he was saying that at that time. People have always been critical of Beatles live shows because, you know, they said what you have to understand is this is what they sound like when they could not hear each other on stage because of the screaming fans. And, you know, he said his analogy was it's like they're trying to do magic in the dark. So that is not what was happening here. This, you know, could have been easily if there was tinnitus or the sound issues or anything, I think there could have been. Uh, treatments between you know the band between the stage the sound check the the musicians everything could have been resolved in a different way i think and not just for one show either you know what i mean it's like if, if it was an ongoing issue then it's something that that could have been dealt with like way far in advance and also harry was wearing an in-ear in -in monitor like it's not like he wasn't wearing a monitor and it's not like Dave has control or Eric or Steven have control over the sound. The engineers do. Yeah. That's is why, like, I hate giving any credence to the Eddie Farrell's account because she's too close to it. You know what I mean? It's like those guys don't control the sound. It's a, if it's loud or if it's been loud and if it's been an ongoing problem, why wasn't it dealt with? She did describe it as like, to me, it seemed like she described it they were deliberately louder, drowning him out or something was the way I read it. And I, the same thing, Scott, I was like, well, how could that be? There's a soundboard and... Yep. It's not. It's making excuses to cover up the fact that there's some real, that Perry has some real struggles. And so part of it's sad. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm sure the tinnitus thing is real. I'm sure that like he's, he's struggling vocally. You know what I mean? And I'm sure that he hasn't has a drinking problem because every single show that we've seen, he's got a bottle of wine in his hand. I mean, in the Lollapalooza documentary, which is an excellent documentary series, by the way. Thanks. Eric actually brought my attention to it. And I, I finished it recently. He's sitting down in that interview just drinking out of a bottle of wine. Like, I mean, this is clearly a thing. When I saw him in 09, I had passes to the Lala Lounge. Lollapalooza and we were walking across this pathway and the security guards stopped us and Jane's addiction came walking by and I have a picture of Perry Farrell in this sequin suit with a bottle of wine you know he's ascending the stage and again you know if you're a vocalist I know I've heard vocalists talk about they don't don't even drink coffee because it it messes with their vocal cords and I would imagine I don't know drowning your vocal cords in wine during a show that can't be good for your voice I would imagine especially if it's that consistent too it's like I mean he's it's I it, like in all the video footage it's all there like there's no question that he wasn't wasted he was drunk well drunk it sounds like even in like, I don't know how much other how much footage of other songs of that show are out there at this point. Like I have a, um, I was able to record summertime roles um, just because I wanted to share it with my kid. Um, and he doesn't sound I mean, it, it was a decent rendition of the song, but the vocals aren't sounding great. You know what I mean? And it's like it's like as the show went on, I was talking about like. I really focused on like the technical, but it sounds like he's honestly it just sounds like his voice gets more and more tired as the time as the show went on. So which again, it's like, I mean, it's really there's a there's a set there's a part of it that's really sad, not just because we've probably lost Jane's addiction forever, but 
because like Perry isn't taking care of himself. And I had mentioned to you guys, I had seen them on their relapse tour in Chicago, 1997, November 3rd at the Aragon Ballroom. And they had just broadcast on Halloween on MTV from the Hammerstein Ballroom, which was a few days before I saw them. You know, they were fantastic. But the night I saw them, Perry comes out in this powder blue jumpsuit or no, sorry, leisure suit. And with these huge platform shoes, I'm talking like Elton John 1970 something platform shoes. They were enormous. And he he couldn't walk really well. But but after a while, I started to realize, well, I don't think it's all about the shoes. And then, as you'd mentioned, one of my favorite songs, Summertime Rolls, he just got lost in the song and he, he stopped like at the second verse and uh, asked the band to start over again, which I mean, they were <laughs> they were not like they were in New York. And, and at the beginning of the concert, he had mentioned how he had such a great time last night during that Halloween show in New York. I'm sitting there thinking, dude, it's like three days later. Where where are you? You know, it was probably one of the worst concerts I've I've ever seen, which was hugely disappointing. So this problem seems to go back a ways. You know, there was no violence, of course. That's a really good point. It gets into I mean, I think I mentioned this briefly, but this band is so was has always been volatile. I mean, the the breakup in the original breakup. Like after, was it like after Lollapalooza? From what I understand, and I don't want to get too specific because I don't know everything, but it had to, like part of it had to do with how royalties were split, but it also had to do with Eric Avery dating one of Perry's exes. That story has been around for a while. So there's been a really bad blood between Perry and Eric for a really long time. And then they got back together. They did that, like the Ninja Tour, I think it was like 0910. And when they played with uh, Nine Inch Nails and Eric left that tour, like ended that tour early. I think he like ended, he left after Australia or something. And then there was like all this like back and forth in the media with them arguing and on different platforms and talking about whose fault it was. And then Jane's Addiction releases The Great Escape Artist, and he has a whole song called End to the Lies, all about Eric Avery and how he's such a liar and an awful person. And I'm like, you wrote a song about this? I was like, just give me a Jane's Addiction record. Because <laughs> there's a, there's some good songs on that, but it's just like those records without Eric are missing the melodic bass, the melodic bass lines that the rest of the instrumentation gets wrapped around. Yeah, Like they talk about this in interviews, like Eric Avery, comes up with these bass lines and then Steven and Navarro, they work responsibly at, and sometimes, uh, and then also sometimes Perry comes in with like a melody and then Eric will build on it. And then they work these things around it. It's like, it's almost like there's a lead bass and a, like a, yeah. there's a bit of a lead guitar, but like every time I hear their music, it's like everything is swirling around this beautiful bass line. I mean, people, Kim Deal is a great bassist. Les Claypool is a great basis to go back to Empire Records, the classic film of the 90s, right? But Eric Avery is the cream of the crop. Like, his bass lines are, as far as I'm concerned, some of the best that have ever been written. Yeah, most of the songs, or a lot of them, start with those bass lines. You know, it's just the signature of the band, the sound. Yeah. The two new songs, like uh, True Love and Imminent Redemption, um, Ha like you they, like the bass comes in and you're like this is jane's addiction you're like i don't know what strays was i don't know what great escape artist was but this is jane's addiction like you hear the bass you hear the other instruments working around the bass and it's like it drives the song fun footnote um eric uh, eric green not eric avery uh eric green and i also bought the uh the studio recordings of this uh excuse me there was a seven inch they were selling at the merch booth of tr uh, true of the studio recordings of true love and imminent redemption and we both bought one i also bought one for a friend right and like we're like i mean i was psyched just to have it you know what i mean it was like cool you know like it's 15 bucks for a seven inch you know what i mean um but as we were walking out you were like it was like platinum or something that we're holding because it's like this is probably the last studio recordings of the original jane's addiction lineup that is ever going to see the light of day yeah side note after the show of course you know there was Perry Farrell's wife coming out with a statement there was Dave Navarro saying the next show was canceled and then the band saying the band is ending this tour and everything but 
of all the times to drop a new song was the other day. They, dro- they decide, all right, now's as good a time as any. Let's put this out now, you know? I think it was yesterday, and the song is called True Love. Yeah. <laughs> I'm drowning in the irony. Well, I, I was... I was looking at the lyrics of the Eminent Redemption song and just kind of paraphrasing some of the pieces of the song. Perry sings, let's all make a comeback. It's not only me. We all need a little redemption, a redeeming, sorry. Can you ever forgive me? And I thought, huh, I suppose, you know, but it's the guys in the band that need to forgive him. Interestingly enough, is that like that, of course, that was written before all this. And it almost seemed like when I first heard that song, I was like, oh, this is interesting. Like Perry is poeticizing his position in the band. Like, and really it seemed like he was coming to terms with it through the music. I mean, the, the lyrics are, were interesting. They grew on me. At first I was like, it feels like a little too um, literal. Yeah, a little too literal. But as it, you know, as I listened to it more, I ended up falling in love more with it. And I appreciated like Perry's prior to the, you know, the big blow up. I appreciated his like, I appreciated the sentiment and his like vulnerability in the song. And it's a gorgeous song. Like, I mean, True Love is also really, really good. Yeah, well, I mean, Scott brought up an interesting point just about, uh, you know, all all these other great bassists, you know, in terms of music history and how Eric Avery really, I mean, you know, I thought uh, Flea obviously is a fantastic bass player, obviously. And you know, yeah. uh, Chris Cheney, I think, was a terrific uh, bassist, too. Duff McKagan did a stint in mm-hmm. James Addiction for a little while, too. And all of these are fantastic musicians, but I think there, there's something about this particular lineup of all four of them and how they all played off each other that made the music magic. But at the same time, <laughs> you know, they are the four personalities they are. And so, mm-hmm. you know, we hope for the best. Hope, uh, hope they can work things out if not well (laughs) we saw the last show ever scott (laughs) yeah i know i'm not hopeful i mean as you get older i think you all have you all can sympathize with this you become a little less tolerant of other people's bullshit and they're older now you know what i mean and like he attacked his bandmate his friend of many many years on stage in public it's hard to come back from that. I mean, Dave Navarro is he Dave Navarro is a superstar in his own right. I, I mean, well, it, it's never right to, you know, get violent and assault another person. And for the fact that he had just come overcome some health issues made it that much worse, I thought. Well, and one one thing I had read this book called Long Road. I don't know if you guys have read it, Pearl Jam and the Soundtrack of a Generation. It's by Stephen Hyden. And in it, he has little bits and pieces, not many, about Jane's addiction. And he talks about how they broke up in 1991 because of infighting and drug abuse or drug use. And as a result, Pearl Jam took over the cultural momentum squandered by Jane's addiction that word squandered always seems to, you know, to me, it's like, man, you know, they have these opportunities, you know, and and again, I'm talking about Perry Farrell mostly here, the show I saw in 97 there, you know, the comeback and it was terrible. And now this, and it's just these, these opportunities where they could really do something. They squandered them away. I mean, it's interesting. You bring that up because I saw I saw Pearl Jam on Tuesday night at Fenway Park and it was my uh, my third time seeing them and <laughs> I joked on social media I said you know eh, something tells me they're going to be better behaved than Jane's Addiction last week and uh you know uh, this lineup of Pearl Jam has been the same since 98 and they you know they've had lineup changes they've had their share of infighting but it never got to that level it was always you know more of a professional situation but you see them you know bringing it to a stadium and bringing their their sound and all of the musicians playing off each other really well and i i think they you know if they if that's true that they they picked up the spotlight that james walked away from in 1991 then i think they've they've really run with it and they've earned their place as one of the greatest live bands of all on the planet like those egos all in one place is going to end up in a place where they're not together. It was like they struck lightning in a bottle for a few years. They wrote a bunch of brilliant songs, three records worth. And then, you know, without, you know, without the original lineup made a couple of kind of middling albums, even though they had, even though they had some hits on them, it was never as magical as the, as the original lineup. I mean, Eric was mentioning this on the way 
through the show, side B of Ritual De Lo Habitual is one of the greatest side Bs ever written. It's like, and it's not fast paced. You know what I mean? It's like a slow burn. Like, I mean, three days, I think I was reading something, somebody, people have said this before, so I'm not original here, but like people talk about three days as being the stairway to heaven of that generation. And that's fine, but it's also like its own thing. It is a journey about drugs and a threesome. But I didn't actually realize that until several years later, because the music to me was always just about being like, it was always just about like being together with someone happy in your own sadness. That's how three days always, always, that's how I always dealt with three days. I feel like classic girls able to do that whole beast. That whole B side does it like it's a brilliant, brilliant B side. And it's like, I mean, we talk a lot about like, um, we're talking a lot about like, you know, the show, how like, I mean, in my estimation, it started good and it steadily went downhill until the, until the explosion or implosion, depending on your perspective. But there was also these like really beautiful moments too. I mentioned this before, but like, I, I want to like, I really want to highlight it. To see the original lineup play Kettle Whistle over 30 years later is something I will never forget. Kettle Whistle is one of their best songs in my estimation. It is right up there with Three Days. It's up there with Then She Did. It's up there with Classic Girl. It's up there with Summertime Rolls. It's up there with Ted Just Admit It. It's that good. And they never played it. Um, like in like when when like when Eric saw them in ninety one, they weren't playing it, right? They didn't play it again until the show like this tour that you saw because they re-recorded it or they recorded it in the studio with Flea. So basically, the original lineup never played it, and it like the version that they did, like how they reworked it, was both melancholy, sentimental, but also very of its moment. It was wrapping up time in and, of, in and of itself, all in the present. And I'm sitting there right in front of them, right? Watching this thing unfold. And while I'm photographing, I'm singing the lyrics along with them. Like I'm like bobbing my head, I'm pumping my fist in the front. And I'm the only photo person there doing it. I'm looking around, I'm like, is anyone enjoying this? I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> um, so, I mean, with, I wanna like hold in tension. Yes, it was like, it's something of a tragedy. I mean, for me personally, I think for Eric as well to watch this, like to watch it kind of devolve yeah. into violence. But there were also really magical and beautiful things about it as well. Like the light on in and of itself was amazing. And when they were on they were on like fours was really good. Pigs and Zen was really good. Three days was epic. Um, so, yeah, I want to I just want to make sure we put a kind of like, I want to like acknowledge that, um, that there was good stuff as well. Well, you know, like, like I was saying with, uh, you know, the album review and everything, it's like, you know, I, I'm glad I saw them in 1991. That was by far the su more superior show of the two. But having said that, I think there's also this whole backstory of Scott and I being friends and getting to go experience this together. The fact that I, I occasionally get to, you know, review concerts and, and stuff is not taken for granted for a second. And the fact that I got to see this show was cool. And that I got to see it with a longtime friend who also, you know, we have a history of loving this band together and stuff. I think it was a cool thing. So, you know, it wasn't, you know, I, I mean, it's too bad that the, there was violence within the band on stage, but I think we, <laughs> I don't know, we just left the venue and went home. We, we were fine. We were, I mean, everything was fine with us. Everyone's texting me, Eric, what the hell's up with Jane's Addiction? What happened at the show? What happened? What, what'd you do? How'd you like, and it's like, dude, I was just standing there watching. <laughs> The uh, what was it? The hard times or the onion or something had some headline you sent me, Scott. Hard times. Oh yeah, hard times has this like epic. I gotta find it because it is worth repeating. Um, <laughs> headline. Where is it? Dave Navarro admits he's surprised nobody punched him sooner. <laughs> really good. Yeah, this has been great. I'm glad we could get together again. I wasn't expecting so soon. Is there anything you'd like to close with? Plug. We mentioned your blog, Eric, at greensparty.tumblr.com. Did I get that right? Yeah, greensparty.tumblr.com, and the concert reviews on there. And I, I, I just feel you know really grateful that I get to cover shows. This past week, it started with Jane's Addiction on Friday, then Tuesday I saw Pearl Jam at Fenway Park, and then last night, very last minute, like at four o'clock, I got approved for uh, Ringo Starr and his All Star Band. 
And, you know, obviously no violence is happening there at that show. And I was very much on the younger end of the spectrum with that. And that was my third time getting to see Ringo. But, you know, I've always been a music geek. I've always loved music and getting to see live music, especially coming out of the pandemic and, you know, any opportunity I get to see bands I love and I'm a big fan of and get to write about and review is exciting to me. And the fact that I get to share it with friends like Scott and have him contribute to it a little is really exciting too. I think what you're doing here with this podcast and talking to people about live music is terrific. And, you know, the fact that the story continues, I, I, I'd love to see like a mashup. Like if you had like everybody who mentions Prince, everybody who mentions, you know, Bruce Springsteen or, or something of that nature. And, and you know, the, the if there was some I don't know, algorithm you had of like the most amount of mentions, the least amount or something after however many seasons, I think that would be a really cool thing. Yeah, we we're, we're actually talking about that. Doug Florzak, he's a producer and, and co-host. Sometimes he's on here with me. And we're thinking about putting something like that together. At, at your suggestion, Eric, we've been thinking about it. We're like, yeah, we should do something like that. Scott, go ahead. Do you have anything uh, to add or close with? I just want to like acknowledge and be grateful for the friendship that Eric and I have shared over the years. You know, you come to a point in your life where you're just grateful for the people that are still that are kind of still around that you share a history with. And last Friday night was like, even with all of everything that was swirling around it, the good and the bad was like really magical because I was there with one of my oldest friends. Very much. Uh, Scott's friendship, uh, definitely something I value greatly. And I was glad that we get to have these fun, fun experiences together and everything. I, actually, you know, uh, Charles, it, you know, you talk about, uh, you know, you, you being based in Chicago, I, I did think of this as we were talking about, you know, Lollapalooza and how uh, Lollapalooza was a traveling festival. And then at a certain point, it became a standalone weekend festival in uh, Chicago. I remember I was visiting Chicago and I, I, Scott was going to grad school there. And I, I remember going there and he brought me to, you know, one of the buildings there. And I, I remember the, o- overlooking, what, what is it, Grant Park? Where, where I think it was like the first or second year it, uh, Lollapalooza had been happening as like a a weekend festival in Chicago. And uh, yeah, he pointed it out and I said, oh, wow, that's where all the clues is. So, um, you know, w- one of these days I'll make it for the festival. One of these days. <laughs> we should go together. The, the you, don't know, you don't know what the screwy thing was? Is I was, so they started that in 2005. I learned from the documentary. My grad year, my graduate school years were 05 to 07 and they had one every single year and I didn't fucking go. I was so not into it. I was like, I'm not going to all of lose a fuck Perry Farrell. You know what I mean? It was like, he ruined Jane's addiction. You know what I mean? Like, and I, did, I didn't go to a single one and I'm watching the documentary. I'm like, fuck, why didn't I go to one? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's such a like pompous thing or like pompous way to be. Like this kind of like fuck everything attitude that I still <laughs> carry a little bit with me to this day. Eric will attest to this. I used to wear a shirt in high school that had like this skateboard kid walking and above it, it said, everything sucks. And that like, I became like the everything sucks guy. <laughs> For better or worse. On brand. <laughs> On brand. <laughs> uh, well, th- this has been awesome, Charles. And hopefully, if, if we're ever witnessing another historic, controversial show, we're, we're happy to come on again, you know? I appreciate you guys taking the time. And it was just like, I threw it out there, sort of half joking, but serious, you know? And Scott's like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Let's do it. So here we are. I appreciate you taking the time to talk about this, and I just look forward to when we can have another conversation about something else. For sure, and I like I'll, I'll just end on the same with the same thing that Eric saying. Thank you so much for having us back. Um, it was unexpected, but super awesome. Like to just to be on the same show with Eric, dealing with this thing, kind of talking like talking about it in more detail than I think we talked about it before. Because at first we were just. We haven't hung out since then. We were just like kind of dealing with the immediate feelings and the aftermath of it. But now it's like, you know, there's more clarity now. Everyone just trying to make sense of it all. And I think doing a podcast like this with eyewitnesses, I think is the only way we really can, you know, work through it. (laughs) Yep. This has been great. Lots of interesting angles and perspectives. Thanks again for coming on. That's a wrap for our show. I want to thank today's guests for sharing their concert stories with us. Make sure to check out our show notes at seeingthemlive.com for links to websites, photos, and other artifacts mentioned in the show. I also want to thank my producer, Doug Florzak. The theme music for the show was composed by Doug and is featured on his album, Flagstone. 
If you have a concert story you'd like to share on our podcast, please visit our website and click on Become a Guest in the main menu. Then fill out the form and click the Submit button. If you seem like a good fit for the show, we'll contact you via email. I guess it's time to head for the exits. We'll see you next time on Seeing Them Live.